international development has failed. And the, the persistence of poverty and hunger uh, and actually growing disparities are clear indications that mainstream development has failed, and it has failed terribly. So clearly, there's a need for new ways of thinking uh, about development and new ways of implementing development. And I think a really good place to start looking for these new ideas is to hear what students have to say, to hear what they're saying about what are the key international development issues that really need to be addressed. So today we're going to hear uh, from three students. Uh, a fourth student, Emily uh, Thornwall, was scheduled actually to talk about her uh, year abroad of studying and actually working in uh, Ecuador. But unfortunately, she was ill, so she's, she's not with us uh, today. So she, she wanted me uh, to send uh, her regrets. Now, each of the panelists will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and because the topics are quite diverse, uh, we'll have some time for questions uh, after each presentation. Now, of course, the panelists will be invited to answer the questions. Um, they'll be given the first opportunity to answer the questions that are raised, but I want to encourage others in the audience, other students in the audience, to offer their perspectives too. Okay? So if, if somebody raises a question and you think that you, you have an interesting dimension that you want to include, then I strongly encourage you to put your hand up and I'll recognize you and, and you can give that input. We want to make this as interactive as, as possible. Okay? So, we'll begin with Caitlin Criddle, who is an anthropology major, uh, but is also obtaining an international studies certificate. And she is in her final semester, yay, <laughs> is what she probably says. It's not yay for us, but it's yay for her. Um, in in um, 20, uh, 2006, she traveled to Kenya with an organization called Free the Children, where she helped build schools and learn about international development issues facing rural communities in that country. Now, in 2012, uh, Caitlin completed a study abroad, uh, a term abroad in Brazil, which concentrated on international rights, uh, indigenous rights, and environmental issues. Now, the title of her presentation is Caring for the Environment, a Development Initiative in the Brazilian Amazon. So we'll, do, we'll start with Caitlin, and then I'll introduce the other panelists as we go along. Caitlin? Thanks a lot. I think this podium needs to be shorter for me. <laughs> Stand on my tiptoes all the time. Good afternoon, guests. I'm going to use this time to talk about environmentally sustainable development and why it's an important issue today. Throughout this presentation, I will make reference to my recent experience in Brazil and discuss a particular development initiative that I believe could provide a framework for development projects in other communities. Sustainable development is defined by the United Nations as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In today's increasingly industrialized world, environmental concerns are intensifying, where a country's economic growth has become the primary goal in mainstream development, exploitation of the environment often becomes the cost of generating profit. With rising concerns, including global warming, increasing greenhouse gases, and climate change, just to name a few, a different approach to development is critical if we do not want to jeopardize the lives of future generations. At the rate we are going, our planet simply cannot absorb the consequences of current development, like pollution and waste. Thus, we need new development initiatives that specifically address these environmental issues. This past summer, I had the opportunity to spend time in the Brazilian Amazon. There, I conducted brief fieldwork among the Caipo people in a small village called Ocre. This is a picture of the village um, it is composed of a circle of huts. In this case, it's a square. Traditionally, it's a circle. Um, and it's completely surrounded by rainforest that appears to stretch on forever. Consideration of the rainforest is important because it does so many things for our environment. It helps to 
stabilizes climate, it reduces carbon dioxide emissions, and it is the source of thousands of medicinal plants and herbs in today's pharmaceuticals. Unfortunately, and I think using the term unfortunate is a major understatement, close to 20% of the Amazonian rainforest has been deforested in the past 40 years. So not only does this affect climate change and CO2 emissions, but it disrupts ecosystems and poses challenges to indigenous populations. Environmentalists insist that action needs to be taken now in order to protect future generations from further damages to our Earth. In 1988, over 10 million hectares of land, of Kaiapu land, was officially demarcated by the Brazilian government. So in this picture here, you can actually see exactly where the border lies. Um, the areas with forest are Kaiapu territories. The other areas are government <laughs> land that has been um, deforested for agricultural and other uses. Um, the Kaiapo are known to be autonomous warriors, and they continue to militantly defend their land from intruders such as illegal miners and loggers. And they are clearly doing a pretty good job. In this way, the Kaiapo are ultimately protecting the rainforest from being completely deforested. Conservationists know we need the rainforest for the benefit of the global environment, while the Kaiapo understand that the conservation of their land is necessary in order to maintain their traditional way of life. However, the effects of globalization have reached even the most remote areas of the rainforest, Kaiapo villages included. Indigenous communities, having been introduced to capital from outsiders, now require income for medical care, education, and imported food supplies. Chiefs have begun to feel pressure to bring outside goods into their communities. This exposure to the global market is a factor encouraging the pursuit of income. It is true that participation in the global market has affected the lives of the Kaiapo, but the desire to continue their traditional way of life remains. When asked, what is the purpose of life? The chief of the village of Okri answered, the purpose of life is to be Kaiapo and to live as the Kaiapo do. And the rainforest remains such a vital piece to Kaiapo personhood. The forest is so important to both their livelihood and their identity. Taking that into consideration, we need development initiatives that address the needs of and desires of the communities in question while simultaneously addressing environmental issues. While spending time in the village, one particular development project really stood out, and to me, it demonstrates that such initiatives combining sustainable economic development with environmental conservation are possible. This project involved the harvesting of Brazil nuts. A local indigenous NGO, the Protected Forest Association, or PFA, partnered with seven Kaipo communities to harvest Brazil nuts for local and global markets. The PFA was founded in 2007 with the aim of strengthening the autonomy of the Kaiapo in the protection and sustainable management of their territories. The organization's executive, staff, and founding partners consist exclusively of members of the Kaiapo, of the Kaiapo communities it represents. So ultimately, it is the Kaiapo who remain in charge over the decisions made regarding their own land. The main strength of this project is its sustainability and independence. Brazil nuts occur naturally in the forest and they are abundant, so there is little risk that they will ever become overharvested. Also, the project does not require additional infrastructure from the outside. The technology required falls within the present capacity of the village. Further, the collection of Brazil nuts is a traditional family activity. They have been collecting Brazil nuts as a food source for generations. This leads to a more equitable distribution throughout the community, since all members are able to participate. So, in the face of a modern global economy, the harvesting of Brazil nuts as a development initiative allows the Kaiapo to maintain economic independence in a way that also conserves their land, which leads to global benefits. There are, however, 
with similar development initiatives that have been done successful in the village. I'm sure you've all heard of the Body Shop. Well, the Body Shop's Trade Not Aid project in the village of Oak Ridge is an example of a development partnership gone wrong. In 1990, the village became involved with the production of Brazil nut oil under the contract with the Body Shop. What is left today is only the remnants of the building that housed the initiative. From the beginning, fair trade was not a factor as the Body Shop had advertised. The company retained control over pricing and how much of the product it wanted to purchase. Thus, it was an unequal relationship where the village was dependent on the choices of the company. Soon, underlying motives of the initiative were exposed. The company wanted to use the Kaibo image to promote their products, as well as their own image as a socially conscious company, even though only a tiny fraction of Brazil nut oil was actually used in their product. So it's argued that the only reason they used Brazil nut oil was to use pictures of the Kaibo for their advertisements. While this example does not speak directly to environmental issues, it highlights the need for community-based participatory development where the community has control over the decisions that are made. Amidst the controversy surrounding development discourse, ultimately there are opportunities for effective development. There can be, as exemplified by Oak Ridge, development projects that incorporate local decisions and provide indigenous groups with the tools and knowledge to develop in an environmentally sustainable way. Caring for the environment should be at the forefront of development initiatives to ensure the health of our planet for the present and future generations. And this example from the Brazilian Amazon can exist as a framework for that. Thank you. Okay, so before we go on to the next speaker, I just want to know whether or not there are any questions or comments. NGOs working in the tribal community align with the goals of like the community members themselves. Did everybody hear that? Sorry, that uh, I guess I asked how do the goals of the NGOs working with the tribal people or in the communities align with the goals of the tribal people themselves? Um, what is particularly interesting about the PFA, the Protected Forest Association, um, is that its membership is composed of the tribal themselves. So they do have the same goals. Um, while I was in the village, there was also um, another NGO that had influence over development initiatives, and it was Conservation International. And Conservation International, their main goals are to conserve the environment um, for the global, the global be benefits that it has. Whereas the Kayapo, in the beginning, they did not necessarily share those the same Western values of conservation. They were more concerned about um, maintaining the forest to maintain their traditional lifestyle. But uh, what is interesting is that the long-term goals, maintaining the forest, it facilitates both ends. So even though these two different groups, Conservation International and the Kaipo, they have different paradigms. As long as you strike a balance, mm -hmm. it can form an effective partnership. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, <laughs> what was the relationship like between the Kaipo and the government? Was it sort of like, did they feel antagonized by the government, or was it sort of indifferent? Or? It's definitely um, like a personal feeling. Um, I couldn't talk directly to the client, but we always had a translator. But you could tell there was definitely feelings of um, antagonism between the Kaipo and the government. Um, the Kaipo, although the government demarcated the Kaipo lands, uh, which means that the Kaipo get to control their territories, they feel that the government doesn't provide them with the necessary um, basic needs like education and healthcare. So there's a lot of different issues, um, and it's really it'd be difficult to explain in depth the.
total relationship between them. They're definitely um, conflicting. Does anybody else have any question or comment? Can I be permitted to ask a question? <laughs> um, this photograph um, is all men are, are in the photo, and I guess I'm wondering, did the project also involve women in any significant way? It did. Um, the Brazil Nut Harvesting Project, since it's traditionally a family um, activity, it's really, it just touches my heart, because um, they go to these Brazil Nut Groves and families, and so you also see the intergenerational relationships. You have grandfathers teaching their young granddaughters um, the ways of the forest and stuff. And that's, I think that's just something you don't see here. You don't see a lot of in, like special intergenerational relationships. Um, and yeah, so it's a family activity and everybody's involved. So the women climb up the trees and mm -hmm. they can knock down the Brazil nut cases. What? Okay, well, we'll have more time once all three speakers um, have given their presentations. You know, we'll be able to also come back to uh, any one of the panelists if you uh, do have any other questions or want more clarification or make a comment. Um, our next speaker is Alexa Taylor, and she's a fourth year university student who is working on a double major uh, in women and gender studies and international development. Uh, she hopes to go on and do some writing and researching in developing countries, specifically on the issue of uh, gender and development, or the issues uh, related to gender and development. Now, the title of her presentation is Dismantling Gender-Based Violence, an Initiative to Empower Women Worldwide. Gender violence is one of the world's most common human rights abuses. Women worldwide, ages 15 through 44, are more likely to die or be maimed because of male violence than because of cancer, malaria, war, and traffic accidents combined. As 2015 closely approaches, we must evaluate the status of the United Nations Millennium Development Goal Number 3 which targets gender equality and the empowerment of women. Although some progress has been made through this initiative, most specifically and importantly in reducing global gender gaps in primary school attendance, what has not been adequately addressed and what remains rampant worldwide are the sexist and misogynist attitudes acutely ingrained into cultures and societies. The prevailing severity of gender-based violence is a product of these sinister and hegemonic mentalities, perpetuating a world where atrocities such as rape, wife beating, honor killings, and the like are all too common, and thus a form of violence that is structural and reproduced by the continuation of unequal gendered social systems. Though some of the most severe forms of barbarity towards women and girls are committed with un within unstable regions of the global south, it must also be recognized that developed countries are by no means free of gender violence or inequality as a whole. The Chinese proverb, women hold up half the sky, so eloquently helps us understand the important role of women and girls in development. If half the population isn't completely valued, respected, and utilized, then how will change and progress sustainably ensue? Although dismantling gender-based violence is only one important element in the greater quest to empower women globally, it is nonetheless a crucial element, and indeed is not isolated, as turning women's oppression into opportunity contributes to a larger framework of development. As Dr. Samantha Nutt writes in her book, Damned Nations, even the most effective humanitarian interventions are stymied because of high rates of female illiteracy in countries such as Afghanistan and Somalia, where girls' education is often seen as antithetical to religious and social norms. Hence, for women and girls to even begin to flourish, 
gender-based violence, and the oppression that it stems from must be thoroughly addressed and entirely demolished. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, rape has been declared an epidemic by the United Nations, particularly in the eastern North Kivu province. 48 women are raped every hour, as reported in a 2011 survey. The Congo has been denounced as the worst place on earth to be a woman, a place where rape is used as a weapon of war. Women and girls are not only sexually assaulted, but in the process are mutilated and utterly humiliated by the perpetrators, who often rape using sticks, knives, or bayonets, or by firing gun bullets into a woman's vagina. Women who have been raped in developing regions are often greatly stigmatized, shunned by their husbands, family, and greater community, which then denies them of any opportunity that they may have had to contribute to society. Fear of rape, especially in conflict zones, also deters women and girls from working or walking what could be a very dangerous road to school. Violence towards women is in so many ways institutionalized and a component of patriarchal society used to keep women submissive. For example, 68% of Indian judges believe that provocative clothing is an invitation to sexual assault. And Ethiopian law explicitly provides that a man cannot be prosecuted for violating a woman or girl if they later marry. Honor rapes and killings are also a grim product of the extreme oppression that women face. It is estimated that there are 5,000 honor killings a year, though these are just the ones reported. Many are disguised as accidents or suicide. As the Confucian saying goes, for a woman to starve to death is a small matter, but for her to lose her chastity is a calamity. Women, prominently in the Muslim world, undergo severe cruelty, such as being stoned to death if it is believed they have lost their virginity before marriage. In the case of rape, to prove it was indeed assault, under Sharia law, it is mandatory for the woman to provide four adult male Muslim eyewitnesses. This is not at all to say that Islam is cruel, but to acknowledge the misinterpretation of the Quran's verses and how such hostility towards women has become institutionalized to fit a patriarchal ideology. Nicholas Kristof, an American journalist for the New York Times, recently published an article titled, Is Delhi So Different from Steubenville? where he argues the grim similarity between the woman who died from vicious gang rape in India and the Ohio gang rape case, where an unconscious 16-year-old girl was allegedly sexually assaulted and then by several males while being toted from party to party. Ironically, Congress in the United States, States has failed to renew the Violence Against Women Act, which was first passed in 1994. Congress has also stalled on passing the International Violence Against Women Act, which would ensure that violence against women is included in the nation's foreign policy. If one of the most influential countries in the world made gender-based viol gender violence a priority, opposed to swelling military aid and raising defense budgets, this would be an affordable and efficient way to prevent conflict and human suffering, as well as make meaningful strides towards international development. However, grassroots initiatives and the community members that they are made up of are the most effective agents for sustainable development and social change. Maktar Mai, an amazing woman who turned her anger and oppression into opportunity, opened her own school for girls in Pakistan, and has also published a memoir after being sentenced to gang rape by the local tribe council as punishment for her family's alleged dishonor. Maktar's education efforts focus on reaching girls in rural areas who she believes need help most. Girls within Mukhtar's school often sing or perform skits against wife beating and early marriage, which showcases local communities' power and agency in advocating for the changes that they want to see. An NGO such as Women for Women International, which helps women and girls recover from the traumas of conflict zones, has developed projects which coincide with the mainstreaming gender equality approach, seeking to integrate men into the process of female empowerment. Women for Women has created an initiative called Ending Violence Against Women in Eastern Congo, Preparing Men to Advocate for Women's Rights. Its goal being to promote understanding and tolerance and to inform males and females alike on the importance of women having access to education, along with being valued as social, economic, and political contributors. Dismantling gender violence and creating opportunities for women to grow 
not only contributes to their own self-empowerment, but then allows them to make the necessary changes to benefit their children and family. This small change can spark a rise in human development amongst the population overall, and therefore reduce poverty, instability, and conflict. The benefits of empowering women are not isolated to just one gender, and in turn are indicative of the shifts that absolutely need to be made to achieve peace in its most holistic form. I would like to wrap up with a quote by George Bernard Shaw. Reasonable people adapt themselves to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to themselves. All progress, therefore, depends on unreasonable people. Such an understanding of the world is certainly true, but as active global citizens, we must question why this is. Why does rampant inequality, which systemically manifests itself in the form of brutal and dehumanizing acts of violence towards women worldwide, still remain an ill-considered issue? And why, then, must we be characterized as unreasonable to change it? The evidence that I have provided affirms that too many societies within this world are willing to accept a certain degree of gender violence before the greater population, governments included, are willing to speak out and make visible the barriers that impede what should be women's right to life, liberty, security, and freedom. There are many efforts that you can take to aid in the fight to empower women worldwide or to simply become more aware of the issue. If you are a student and time and money permits, you can consider living and studying abroad in places in the developing world, where you can get a first-hand understanding of the people and their particular struggles and achievements. If you enjoy giving to charitable foundations, avoid giving money to short-term development projects, money for things such as livestock, or even sending goods such as toothbrushes, soap, and clothing, and instead give to long-term projects, such as investing in girls' education or women's advocacy groups for men. These are sure to result in a more sustainable outcome. You can invest in microfinance through a website called Kiva, where you can give loans to women entrepreneurs all over the world. This helps women become economically stable as you help them start up their businesses. If you're looking for great reads, I highly recommend two books that I have referenced immensely, Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Rudin, and Down to Nations by Samantha Nett. Change is a slow process, but I truly believe that it starts from the ground up. It starts with us being informed and staying informed. It starts with us spreading the word and having important conversations about issues such as this. It starts with us recognizing the inequalities and the injustices so that we can begin to forge a clear path towards transformation. A clear path towards eliminating gender violence and oppression and towards empowering women worldwide. There is still much work to be done, but I hope in my short time up here, I have informed you, angered you, and most importantly, persuaded you to think differently about the priority of gender and development. Thank you.
I think somehow, um, I mean, after the first uh, presentation, um, I have a sense that it seems to be much easier to think about how we could change our mindset around the environment. You know, I don't, it, you know that we're in fact even to some extent seeing some advancements in that in that field. Um, but after hearing Alexa's talk, um, it just strikes me just how uh, how huge the problem is, <laughs> and how so uh, terribly important it is that, that gender-based violence be uh, addressed. But um, it just seems so difficult to get a sense of where to start. Um, and I don't know if you just want to comment on that um, or just. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> well, I think um, a lady named Lisa Bloom, who's a legal analyst in the U.S., she recently, and not too long ago, wrote a book called Think, which is basically just, um, I guess, trying to persuade people to just open up their minds and um, just stay informed on issues, because she believes that when you're informed, that's the first step to making a difference. Um, you can also get involved in lots of organizations. For example, Amnesty International and Regina, um, their group usually meets about once a week. And um, they do a lot of things, even such as weather writing, which has been proven to be really effective. And um, even though they weather write about all sorts of human rights abuses, um, it definitely can coincide with empowering women to their beliefs um, initiatives such as that to get involved in and weather writing to say um, the government's about changing um, policies at the international level that even though grassroots initiatives are important, um, policies at the international level are important too, not only in the U.S., but in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm going to look up after, uh, after today is uh, I'm going to look at the uh, Canadian International Development Agency website to see how much of their budget actually goes to uh, this issue of ending gender-based Violence. You know, I just would like to see how much of our Canadian dollars uh, is directed um, or are directed to that uh, to that goal. Okay, well, let's move on to the third uh, and final speaker, uh, Tanil Brooks. Uh, by the way, her name was uh, spelt incorrectly on the poster. It's uh, Tanil Brooks and not Brooks. <laughs> so B R U C K S. Um, she's a third year uh, student uh, who's studying international development. And she's passionate about social and environmental justice issues and uh, finding ways to live more sustainably. Um, she's uh, looking into uh, concepts like food sovereignty and local food initiatives and hopes to bring some awareness on campus uh, about these issues. She's also an avid gardener and has been involved in community gardening uh, in the city. Uh, and also worked as the campus uh, coordinator of the Green Patch uh, project last summer, which is a, a community garden on campus here. And as far as I know, it's an, it's an ongoing project, so if you're interested in, in participating in that project, you can talk to her after. Um, she's here to talk about, uh, and this, the title of her presentation is The Potential of Agroecology and uh, Food Sovereignty. development for decades, but still we have not found a solution to poverty and hunger, even though we produce far more food in the world than is necessary. The recent food crisis spread fear about the future of food, but the truth is that feeding the world's growing population is not the challenge. 
We are already producing over one and a half times more food than is needed to feed every person on the planet. But the poorest, most struggling, small-scale farmers still can't afford to buy food. We need to pay attention to exactly where, how, and for whom food is being produced. Currently, we have two different food system models. We have, on one hand, large-scale industrial agriculture, and on the other hand, we have a model called food sovereignty. Food sovereignty promotes small-scale methods called agroecology, along with the redistribution of food-producing resources, such as land, develop an agriculture system that would feed the entire planet. This included exporting technologies used in wealthy nations around the world, such as intensive irrigation, pesticides, synthetic fertilizer, and improved seeds, and continues to promote export crops rather than food to feed local populations. So how sustainable is industrial agriculture? In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you kind of a very quick overview, um, best I can, and talk to you about a way that we can create a socially, ecologically just food system. And more specifically, I will discuss what food sovereignty looks like based on a model called agroecology. So first off, I want to give you four main problems addressed um, with, with the industrial scale agriculture. I want to remind you, I'm a gardener, not, not a farmer. So I don't know everything, um, but I can address your questions as I can. Um, so the first problem addressed is that the industrial food system is completely dependent on oil. Oil is needed to run machinery, to produce fertilizer and chemicals, and to process and distribute food thousands of miles away from where it was harvested. The only reason we should need to double food production, as some have recommended, is because we continue to, prior to prioritize livestock production and biofuel for, for vehicles over feeding hungry people. I will use the example of meat consumption. According to David Pimentel, professor of ecology, if the entire world ate the way the U.S. does, we would exhaust all known fuel, fuel reserves in seven years. So let me clarify, I'm not saying that eating meat is the problem, but the way that we are producing meat, the way we are producing our food, is the problem. And who it is being produced, produced for. 40% of the world's grain, especially corn and soybean, are fed to livestock rather than people. So if we want to tackle climate change and feed the poor, which are two um, issues in development, we really need to look at the way we produce food, including where it is produced, how it is produced, and whom or what it is being produced for. So problem number two is a massive loss of biodiversity, which reduces our ability to cope with environmental problems. Industrial agriculture makes food production as simple and fast and streamlined as possible through what we call monocultures. So monocultures are when you grow one species in a huge field um, or, or a big farm. <laughs> we control um, and we're finding out that when you put a bunch of species in one area like that, your chances of, of disease and infection spreads and it becomes a huge problem, which is why industrial agriculture is so dependent on chemicals and why factory farming pumps animals full of antibiotics. Which leads to problem number three. The loss of soil fertility and resilience. So to live our modern lives the way we do, we've learned incredible ways to control nature. We control bugs and weeds with chemicals, and then when the health of the soil is lost, we just add chemical fertilizer onto it. Industrial chemicals pollute air and water, not to mention the effects on humans and livestock. And then the more chemicals and tilling, the more the soil erodes, which continues the cycle of trying to fix the soil with chemicals, which creates deserts. Um, a huge issue in development and with in agriculture especially is how do we reduce drought? Drought is the number one cause of crop failure. So um, in agriculture, I'll get to it after, but agroecology is essential to reducing drought. 
Problem number four, our dependency on corporations to feed us. Corporations control every chain of the food system, from seed to manufacturing to processing to distribution and sales. Their goal as a corporation is to maximize profits for their shareholders, not so people can consume healthy food or so that farmers are paid well. One example is the dependence of farmers on genetically modified products. Farmers are convinced that GMO seeds will produce a better crop, so they buy seeds and chemicals sold to them together as a package. The seed is planted and the chemical is sprayed, which kills every plant and pest except for that genetically resistant plant. But over time, nature has a way of adapting, and weeds and bugs become stronger. You maybe have heard the term superbugs, it's true. <laughs> And farmers are forced to invest and to continue in investing in seeds and chemicals. But even more financially draining is that these GMO seeds um, cannot be collected the following year. So farmers must continue to invest in seeds and chemicals, continuing that cycle of dependency on corporations. Again, a major question in development is how can we feed the world, reduce poverty and hunger, and climate change? So this is where food sovereignty comes in. Food sovereignty is more than just an idea. How many of you have heard of the term food sovereignty before? I want to give you kind of a brief, a few of you. Learn this term. <laughs> understand this concept. It's going crazy and you need to understand how we can better produce food for not only our communities in Canada, but this is an issue for development, but it's also an issue in Canada. Um, so food sovereignty is a way where we can help people secure the necessities of life to look after the environment and to create healthy food systems. Food sovereignty came out of a grassroots movement of struggling farmers in the Global South and in Canada. Um, if you're familiar with the National Farmers Union, they were actually one of the um, organizations that started this idea of food sovereignty um, with an organization called the Via Campesina. And since 1996, since they and brought this idea to light, there has been millions of farmers, landless peasants, indigenous people, migrant workers in over 70 countries representing 200 million farmers. So food sovereignty means the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable methods and their right to define their own agriculture systems and food policy. Food sovereignty does not necessarily do away with trade, but it upholds that domestic agriculture should be protected, and each country should determine their own right to the, their own level of self-sufficiency. National policy should uphold the right of peoples to safe and healthy food produced in an environmentally sustainable way. But most importantly, food sovereignty is a solution to global hunger because it puts control of food and seeds and land and other resources back in the hands of people, especially the global poor. So agroecology then is a way to meet this goal of food sovereignty. It's the agriculture method of food sovereignty, a method. According to Oliver de Schuper, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, agroecology is a necessary alternative to create sustainable agriculture development that reduces poverty and feeds the world only through the environment to ensure that future generations can produce food. Agroecology is a farmer-centered, small-scale model that builds, that blends new science with traditional farmer knowledge to build balanced ecosystems that allow farmers to have a viable income. Agroecology is an approach where nutrients and energy are recycled on the farm using a variety of uh, organic techniques rather than relying on expensive chemicals. So here's how agroecology addresses those four problems I mentioned earlier. Number one, agroecology is not dependent on outside inputs. So like, like oil, because food is produced on a small scale um, and is not dependent on chemicals, it is not dependent on chemicals. <laughs> if animals are put back into the pasture and animal waste is properly recycled into the soil rather than causing pollution. Solution number two, agroecology thrives on biodiversity. 
So the opposite of monoculture described earlier is a system called polyculture. There's my husband. <laughs> polyculture <laughs> is one of the current techniques used in agroecology. It's the process of planting two or more crop, two or more plants in one crop together, which can yield have have higher fire, uh, have higher yields than when grown alone. Polyculture crops also reduce soil erosion and provide better protection against climate change, like I said earlier. This takes skill and knowledge of the land and really connects farmers to knowing a variety of crops and really understanding the land that they're working with. And to know which plants help reduce um, certain, certain pests and using certain plants to attract other pests and also to retain um, water and nutrients. So for example, grains, fruits, and vegetables can all be planted in one area. And solution number three, agroecology builds the soil. Because of this wonderful system where everything is working together, rather than working against nature, agroecology works with nature and uses the natural resources that are there. It uses organic composting, animal waste, and no tilling to build up the soil, along with water saving and agroforestry <coughs> methods um, that effectively reduce drought. And solution number four, agroecology is absolutely fundamental to development because it depends on the knowledge of local farmers and consumers. It promotes self-sufficiency and helps farmers to cut dependency on corporations. Development initiatives that push for industrial agriculture often bring in so-called expert knowledge from Western countries and give farmers a sort of a plan. But it should be the other way around, much like what Caitlin was talking about with the Kyoko. The development initiatives should come from the local people themselves to be able to um, develop initiatives for food production or, or for local incomes and what they need. So again, development initiatives must be led by the people and must be respectful of different cultures and ways of living to actually benefit impoverished communities. Some people ask, how efficient is it? But agroecology is just as, if not more, efficient than industrial systems because biodiversity reduces the risk of crop failure, disease, and drought, and it is far less costly. In a report by Oliver de Schuper, he cites a study of 20, 286 agroecological projects, and he found that there was an increase of 79% on average, just by switching models. In conclusion, agroecology is not a way of going back to the past or everyone becoming a farmer, but it is a way about allowing farmers to survive as farmers and respecting the knowledge that they have gained through generations of experience. It is about using the best possible techniques that one, provide a viable income for farmers and preserve while well, preserving the environment, two, support communities' unique local identity and food cultures, and three, do not rely on outside means to produce food. Food sovereignty is about giving the global poor a real chance to make a living and to feed their communities in a way that they can respect. Both agroecology and industrial mo food models are ways of ensuring food security, but the question is, who can do it in a more socially just and environmentally sustainable way? Thanks. I just want to mention that Daniil actually hopes to, I think it's pretty certain that she's going to be participating in a six week long permaculture workshop, uh, it's a course actually that's offered by the University of Alberta and the course takes place in Cuba and uh, Cuba, um, to my knowledge, is the only country on this planet <laughs> to have actually adopted uh, agroecological models of food production 